following is a presentation of HBO Sports. The end shadows every beginning. Ignore the truth of that fact as long as you can. It's simpler to live that way. More sensible to deny the darkness that lies ahead. Unless you can't. Unless your worst fears are what drive you. Unless your most vicious demons are what propel you. Unless you define your life by death. Always remember, no great fighter ever runs from the darkness that lies in front of him. It's much more natural to embrace it. My name is Johnny Tapia. I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 1967. A rugged place, you know? A lot of scary moments, a lot of messes, a lot of messes, people bleeding all over the place. It was, uh, it was pretty deadly. But uh, that's where I'm from. I was born and raised there. For all the darkness that surrounded Johnny Tapia as a young boy, the beginning of his life was defined more by what wasn't there than what was. His father, he was told, was murdered while his mother was pregnant with him, which made what happened when Johnny was eight all the more difficult to bear. It was a Friday afternoon. My mama said that I was going to my grandma's house because she was going to go dancing. She liked to go dancing on Friday and Saturdays. I didn't want her to go. I begged her not to go. And uh, she never came back. They found some of her jewelry. And uh, about three days later, they said she was in a hospital. Four days later, they said she was dead. And the truth is, it, it, it's, uh, it's not like she got hit with a car, or I wish it would happen that way. But by her being stabbed 22 times with an ice pick and it raped. I still remember waiting at that door for my mom to come and pick me up. As she said, I still wait at the front door for her. And it's never going to come back. She's never going to come back. Virginia Tapia's murder would be classified as officially unsolved when the police closed the case a year after the crime. While the son she left behind only got more practiced with his family's struggle to stay afloat. My whole childhood, we were very, very poor. I was raised with my grandma and grandpa. We were on welfare, and, uh, but we made it. My grandfather was a real rugged, tough, macho man. He had to be. He was the head of the family. Eight brothers, six sisters. I call them my brothers because I was born and raised with them, but they're all my uncles and aunties. Well, my brother Randall used to challenge me with other little kids in the, in the community center. You know, everybody comes from everywhere, and uh, they tell me, fight this guy, fight that guy. If I beat him up, I get a dollar. I never did like to fight street fight, but I did a lot of them. Yeah, it was normal. I came 11 years old. I tried boxing. My first fight, I got a knockout in 30 seconds. And since then, I never stopped. In the blue corner is Johnny Tapia, 15-year-older from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He has been boxing for just 18 months, so you've got a lot of experience against a youngster that has not been around in this sport that long in Tapia, but despite that lack of experience, he has reached the championship in the 100-pound division. I won the Golden Gloves five years in a row. I won two-time nationals. I had 122 fights, 
I had 101 win, 21 losses, 65 knockouts. Made it number one in the world for six years in a row. Tim Agrappa was a, was a fighter. He was always there for me in boxing and amateur, and I wanted to take after his footsteps. And I wanted to be somebody. To do that, he turned to a local Albuquerque manager trainer named Paul Chavez. And on March 28, 1988, he made his debut as a professional. Yappy has had quite an amateur career. This is his pro debut. He came in from Albuquerque. This is his manager, uh, Paul Chavez, paid their own plane fare to get out here. <laughs> Giant type of throws that long, open left hook. That's a vicious punch if it lands. His first pro fight would end up a draw. But after that, there was no stopping Johnny Tapia. The, the good combinations by Tapia, that's his trademark. I mean, that, when he's fighting well, that's what he will do. This is for my grandma for Mother's Day. I'm going to give it to her. Johnny Tapia was 23 years old, undefeated, and poised to break out as one of boxing's new stars. But outside the ring, he was still living in a dark, dangerous world. He was a member of Albuquerque's Wells Park Locos gang and had begun using cocaine. First time I did it, I was like, wow, man. I enjoyed it. That's why I kept on doing it. Okay, it was my mistress. He'd fail his first drug test in June of 1990, and several more over the next few months, stalling his boxing career. And then, while preparing for his return, he was arrested by Albuquerque authorities. What happened, Johnny? I don't know. They just went and picked me up from training. What? What'd you do? I don't know. I was just training, working out, getting ready for the fight, and they got me. Today's events probably end the boxing career of Johnny Tapia, the Albuquerque super flyweight. As we heard at the top of the show, Tapia was arrested for threatening to kill a witness in the murder trial of his cousin. At about the same time, the State Athletic Commission was calling a news conference concerning Tapia, but it had nothing to do with his arrest. Tapia had flunked another drug test, one administered the same day he received a conditional boxing license. Both laboratories reported positive cocaine detection. The ensuing suspension would ultimately keep Tapia out of boxing for a total of three and a half years. Probably a lot of stupidity, basically. You know, using and fighting. And it's probably the thing that was a lot of depression, a lot of anger that I couldn't control. Probably in 90, 91, and 92, I was at my worst. He took boxing away from me. I didn't have nothing. He was broke and frequently homeless. With no job, one of his only routes to income came here at an Albuquerque bar, where he'd collect $300 cash and a case of beer for taking on all challengers inside its giant cooler. The only weapons barred in these brawls were loaded guns. Everything I destroyed was myself. I didn't want to hurt nobody or do anybody, but it was my battles with, the, with, with cocaine, with my addiction. I battled with that drug for, it has been a demon for many years. You know, I, I just never could cry out to my mom to help me. When I was addicted to coke, I ended up dying in some, I don't know who today. They went and uh, they left me off and they dropped me off dead right there. They figured out my tattoos and uh, they called the doctor and they revived, they revived me right back. I don't even remember nothing but my wife holding my hand. Tapia met 20-year-old Teresa Chavez in the midst of his suspension and personal turmoil. She was as tame as he was wild, a source of stability for the troubled fighter to grab a hold of. I met her at a barbecue. I wanted to date her, but she didn't want to date me. You know, and uh, I kept on pushing it and pushing it everywhere she go, I follow. I told her, once I ever get you, I'm gonna marry you. I got her and I married her. I kiss your bride, Johnny. I love you forever. 
She didn't know I was a bad drug addict. I hid it from her. A couple of guys told her, if you really want to know what Johnny is, go to the restroom. And they basically told her, and she caught me. She was mad, 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 but she didn't know the real me. That night, I ended up dying that night on her. That's how it started off. That's how it started off as Teresa Tapia. Nine months later, with her new husband still racked by cocaine, the only thing she could think to do to save her marriage was to lock them both inside their small rented home in the hopes of drying Johnny out. The house had wrought iron. I couldn't get out. She had the keys. She didn't trust me. I didn't trust myself either. If I got out, I would have never came back. I went cold turkey. I had no choice. The first three weeks were rough. Who shakes everything. I was doing a lot of cocaine. I was doing a lot of cocaine. I broke everything in the house. She's like, go and break it. You're going to fight pretty soon. You're going to pay for it all, you know? I broke everything. But she said, you can break everything. I'm still going to stay here. About the fourth week, I started doing push-ups. It's a little weak. Then I started doing sit-ups, and then I started running in place. And then uh, Paul, Paul Chavez came and picked me up, and we, I started running. Boxing was the love of my life, and that's what I wanted. In 93, they gave me a chance. I came back in 94. Uh, Johnny, you get yourself in shape right now, right? You're not 100% yeah. now. No, I, no, by all no means, I'm not 100%. Right. I'm not even at 85. Right. But once I do, I'll be at 110. Okay, but when you're back at 110, look out, because uh, the baby face assassin. He returned to the ring in Tulsa, Oklahoma in March of 1994. So I look at Johnny Tapia, first time in four years that he has been in a boxing ring. He has had his problems with drugs on more than one occasion. He says now his act is completely cleaned up and he is ready to go and looks forward to attaining the lofty position that he was in before. He literally was a step away. Good shot to the body, left to the head, down goes Olvera. He's asking him, that's allowed. Oh, Lordy. Continue, here comes Tapia. Left hooks to the body, down goes Estrada. Tapia's already turning backflip. Oh, oh that hurt him. There's a right hand drives him into the ropes. These are huge shots. I mean, Johnny Tapia is hitting him with combinations that are hard. That's the kind of thing that knocks people out. If he can land two more body shots here, he'll get him out. And he does. You called it. Fatigue definitely a factor. And that's it. Marty Duncan has stopped the fight. Johnny Tapia with his fifth consecutive impressive performance, fifth consecutive win since he's come back after a three and a half year layoff and make it 25 straight wins now overall. Falling down and coming back up, uh, I'm proud of myself for once, and I just hope to get bigger and better things. Who are some of your favorite fighters? Julio Cesar Chavez, Sugar Ray Leonard. I like the style of Sugar Ray Robinson, a punch, uh, puncher and a boxer. Right, kind of like your style. Uh, my manager, Paul, predicts me as a Sugar Ray Robinson, but I want to be a Johnny Topper style, you know? I, 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 come with some, I come up with some things that people don't even do. But like I say, uh, I'm really focused for this fight. I've never been so serious for a fight. That fight would be his first world title shot, set to take place on October 12th, 1994. We're going to be making history that night, because this is going to be the first night ever for a local boy that was born, raised, and reared right here in Albuquerque to fight for a world title. Ladies and gentlemen, from La Casa de los Lobos, the pit, here at the University of New Mexico, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Man, this is in my hometown. You know, look at all those people. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, Henry El Martinez. And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the red corner. He is the pride of Albuquerque, New Mexico, presenting the baby. Hey, nobody was going to be there. Johnny Tapia. I'm ready to go. Just throw the first punch. Since Johnny Tapia came back from that almost four year layoff, he's a different fighter. He's a banger now. Very tight. They've each had a good round in this contest, and they have raised their intensity level up to the championship level. Tapia is whacking away with that left hook. He now has a beat on Martinez for the first time with that hook. Oh, my. Big right by Tapia. Hurts Martinez. At some point in these fights, technique gives way to sheer determination. And we're coming close to that point. I think we may be there. Good jab by Tapia. They both wail away here in round eight. If you're going to put me on a stretcher, make sure I go straight to the hospital. But I, don't, I would never lose in my hometown. At this 
crowd makes Johnny Tapia a better fighter. Is the adrenaline flowing in Johnny Tapia? I guess so. My goodness. It's flowing like molten lava here. That's what Johnny Tapia does the best. He is going after Martinez is hurt. accomplishment in my life to come back through everything that I've been through. The beautiful thing of all things was I won in my hometown my first world title and the fans were crying for me because I, you know, like I said, I, I, I died and come back. It's been a long road and at the end of the tunnel there was a lot of, lot of shiny light. Johnny, your emotions right now. I'm very excited. I got to give a lot of thanks to him. He's one of the tough fighters out there. My manager, my grandpa, my grandma, my wife, and Mally. You made Everybody it all the way. in Albuquerque, my brother. We made it, baby. It's been a long road. I was happy. Glory, just like I did it, babe. We both grabbed each other, hugged each other, and we cried because I didn't do it myself. I did it with my wife. She stood there. She stood right there, and at the end, it was a, it was a broken puzzle ready to be fixed. But I have put her through hell more than anybody here. She went through all the downs that I went through, and she went through all the ups that I had. And she stood there. She should have left us a long time ago. But she knew that there was a better Johnny in me. Teresa Tapia became her husband's manager in 1995. He was fighting six times a year and continuing to accumulate victories at every stop he made. But now there was another undefeated star from Albuquerque, seven years younger than Tapia, who come onto the scene. His name was Danny Romero. Danny was coming up as a champion, and I was already kicked out of boxing. He was coming up, and I was the bad guy. He was the good guy. I did the drugs and go to jail. He did everything good, you know? And when I came back into boxing, I was taking some of his spotlight. So that's when he started calling me out. All right, let's go to, to Johnny Tapia now that we know that fight is going to happen. We presume it will you happen. See what happened tonight? It'll happen the same way. The same way it's going to happen. He don't want none of this. The words are, I want Danny. I want Danny. I got to dispose of a little, uh, a little gnat that has been all over me, so it's time to get, get rid of it. Even though the fighters made clear what they wanted, it would take nearly three years to put the bout together. But when it was finally scheduled for the summer of 1997, it was engulfed by animosity and tension. Not to mention rumors that gangs in New Mexico were taking sides in the dispute. Tonight, from the Thomas and Mack Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, HBO Sports presents a hometown rivalry to rival all rivalries. As fellow Albuquerqueans Danny Romero and Johnny Tapia finally come together in their battle for the Junior Bantamweight Championship of the World. And because of the enormous emotion that attaches to this Albuquerque battle, extraordinary precautions in the Thomas and Mack Center tonight. Close to 100 uniformed police visible in the arena. Every single patron and official who enters walking through a screener. And among those Las Vegas policemen who are working the bout, three specially trained gang observation units to watch the body language and the communication in the crowd here in Las Vegas. <laughs> Round one begins. They waited years. Tapia loves to start fast. Romero will want to establish his technical superiority. Tapia wants to lure Romero into a war. Every punch has mean intentions. Every punch is meant to hurt the opponent here. Tapia digging to the body with two left hooks as Romero lands a counter left. Tapia lands a hard right-hand counter, and the crowd goes wild. 
You look good, son. In and out, box this guy and have some fun. We look good, not just beat us. You own him, son. All right, right hand across the top by Tapia. He's been remarkably effective in landing power punches, and he digs to the body one more time. Tapia taunting Romero for the benefit of the largely pro Johnny Tapia crowd. Right hand after the bell by Tapia. Warning number one from Mitch Halpern. Right, right hand by Romero. Best punch of the fight. Romero more than double Tapia on power shots in the sixth. And he starts the sixth with a right hand. So momentum seeming to shift suddenly in the bout now. Early part of the fight belonged to Tapia. Romero has established himself in the middle rounds. I'm a good young champion, big man. Hi, I love you. Three rounds to go in the Battle of Albuquerque. Now Tapia lands a left hook and a straight right hand. And Romero comes back with a counter left. In one sense, Jim, both men have so much invested in this that they're almost afraid to lose. But neither man is a loser tonight. They gave the world of boxing something to wait for, and they made it worth waiting for. Hard left hook to the body by Tapia. Crowd trying to lift their man. A good round for Romero. Tapia's trademark backflip. Let's wait and see what the scorecard said. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the decision of the judges at ringside. Judge Dr. Clark San Martino scores it 116-112. Judge Jerry Roth scores it 116-112. Judge Glenn Hamada scores it 115-113 to the IBF and WBO Junior Bantamweight Champion of the World. Bob Kirk already knew who was the champion. I was the champion before, and I was the champion after. He was now undeniably a star. His fame sealed as the champion who'd emerged from the darkness to rehabilitate himself. Even as unbeknownst to the public, his drug abuse between bouts had never really stopped. He had linked up with a new trainer along the way, a former fighter from New England named Freddie Roach. He's one of the greatest fighters in the world today. He's probably the most exciting fighter in the world today also. He wouldn't be judged happy without, without those demons, I guess. If he was just, you know, straight, laced, real nice guy, he probably wouldn't have been as, as good as he is. Are you satisfied with the way your career has gone now and the way you've been matched up? Are you looking for one more big mark? You know what I'm basically looking for is to retire undefeated. I've been through hell and back, and God's on my side. He's protected me, you know, and I'm only getting better with age, too, as in the fighting game. He's just like a down-to-earth, ordinary person, you know? He don't let fame get to him. That's my dog. I got nothing but love for my homie, eh? Right here, Donnie! The winner and the new WBA Bantamweight Champion of the World, Johnny Tapia! This came out in the Chicago Tribune. You broke up the mugging of a 74-year-old man the morning after the fight. How, which fight was tougher for you? There was these five guys that jumped, uh, jumped an old man. And I didn't appreciate the fact one bit that they were all hitting him. So I got involved and did what I had to do to, to protect the guy. You held the guys for the cops? You, you took the teenagers off this guy? Well, I didn't hold them, but I was hitting them too. <laughs> OK. <laughs> His joy, fearlessness, and passion were always easy to see inside the ring. Even as the struggles and pain of his past 
never seem more than an arm's length away. Most intensely, when Teresa Tapia had investigators reopen Johnny's mother's murder case after two decades to help him find the closure he'd never had. 23 years ago, his mother, Virginia Tapia Gallegos, was found here along Albuquerque's West Mesa. She had been stabbed more than 20 times, and to this day, no one has been arrested or charged with her murder. I wanted to find who murdered his mother. With the champs okay, Jerry Waltz brought together an elite group of investigators. Four months ago, they came upon a file detailing the case. In it are statements from witnesses, the last people to see Gallegos, lists of physical evidence, including blood stains on a pair of men's shoes and inside a car, and fingerprints from beer cans. Waltz thinks it all points to one suspect and an accomplice. The investigators officially solved the crime in the spring of 1999, 24 years after it took place. The Tapias say they were told the killer is the man they suspected all along. The man last seen with Johnny's mom, and who was interviewed by investigators more than once. Turns out he died eight years after the murder in a hit and run accident. Johnny's been going through different emotions. Uh, one day he can be very upset, next day he can be crying, next day he'll be very angry. It was a closure in, in, in my heart, in my soul, that they finally found out, but it's kind of pissed off it took so long so many years when they had the right guy right there and then. I went in him first. I was going to hurt him. But he died. You know, a car ran over him three times, but maybe it was for the best. I just stabbed the shit out of him like he nobody's business. I want him so bad, that guy, I, I still think about him. How he did the rest of my life with no problem in, in prison. Just knowing that I got him. Nobody ever touches my mama. I don't care who you are, what you are, how you are. Nobody puts their hands on my mama. That's the love of my life. It's my queen. The saddest part of my life is I'll live with my mother. I try to kill myself so many times. It just seemed to come back. But I struggle with that every day. I want my mom. I want my mom. I can't have her today. Just a few weeks after he learned who killed his mother, Tapia was still reeling, but due back in the ring for his next fight. Set to face a formidable foe in the southpaw, Holy Ayala. I want a good clean fight. Keep the punches up. Give me a clean fight. Check him up. Here we go. This is the real thing. I guess it's safe to say there's some bad blood here, Steve. Pretty accurate statement. Tapia, a constant movement going to the body. Hardly ever a dull fight with this guy. So aggressive. Tapia nearly slipped. Ayala pushing Tapia back, and Tapia marching forward with a barrage of his own. Tapia boxing beautifully with a left and a right combination. Saves the round. Tapia saves the round. Hey, Johnny, this is your life. All right? Let's go to work, okay? All right? All right? All right? Go get it. Go get it. Tapia trying to get the crowd going. We do have a unanimous decision as the judges agree the winner and the new WBA Bantamweight Champion of the World, Holly Ayala. I don't know what happened. I just, just like everything just got quiet on me and I can't say what really happened to me. And they said they gave it a unanimous decision. So I gave it my all. Hey, everybody loses. That's not a problem. But you don't have to steal it from me. You want me to tell you what really, really hurt me? Looking at my wife's eyes. She keeps me going in life. She keeps me strong. And when I seen her eyes, it's just like I let her down. 
I have before quite a bit of times, you know. But in the ring, I would never do that. And I let myself down for losing. Every other time Tapia entered the ring as a pro fighter, boxing had alleviated whatever pain he was enduring. Losing was a new thing to experience, and he didn't take well to the sensation. There were two mental breakdowns in late 1999, and diagnoses of ADHD, bipolar disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Still, his career continued, and he won a fourth world title in his next bout, setting up a chance to redeem his only loss against Ayala in the fall of 2000. We have a unanimous decision, all three in favor of the winner, Polly Ayala. Oh, it's happened again, folks. I'll tell you what, I, I I'm can't agree. I just can't agree with I that. can't agree. I you know, I know I've always used that word, and I don't want to use it today, so don't I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave it home. But something's not right when that type of thing happens. I don't understand that decision. Some pushing and shoving going on, and it's understandable here how Johnny Tapia thinks he was robbed. Very emotional, passionate Johnny Tapia, extremely upset. A distraught Johnny Tapia has to be, uh, has to be assisted off. I really think that I didn't lose those fights with Paul Ayala. If you beat me, it's fine. I take it. I accept it. I won't fight you again. I mean, I, I wanted to turn, take on the whole world. I was pissed. It, broke, it took my pride, it took, took my feelings from me. The disbelief was more hardened after his second loss, and he moved on without another evident collapse. By early 2002, he rebounded and won a fifth title belt in New York City. Johnny Tapia is an outstanding fighter, one of the biggest little men in boxing over the last decade, and a compelling personalities whose battles with his own demons outside the ring have been as fierce as his battles with opponents inside the ring. The biggest payday of his career came later that year. Two million to fight Mexican star Marco Antonio Barrera. Here he comes with his manager wife, Teresa, just over his left shoulder. Freddie Roach, the trainer, just to his left in his third tour of duty as a trainer to Johnny Tapia. Tapia, who changes trainers and promoters the way rest of us change socks, has had 11 different trainers in his career. A boxing exhibition tonight for the man Johnny Tapia called the king of the featherweights. Marco Antonio Barrera of Mexico City trades down the stretch with Johnny Tapia, sealing what was apparently a clear victory over the New Mexico legend. Shortly after that fight, an accidental overdose left Tapia in a coma, the third time his drug use had put him on the brink of death. I know there's a heaven. It's what you read in the Bible, you know? Says the streets are made out of gold. They say it's beautiful. I don't know why God has me here today. I'm here for a purpose and a reason, but He just have it to me. His relapses would continue to intensify over the next several years. And though he'd somehow always find his way back to the ring, he'd never again fight for a world title. For so many years, I've been trying to find out who's Johnny Tapia. I know I'm a lovable, caring person. I like to give people. I like to give whoever I meet the world. If I don't have it, we'll try to get it. But there's just one side that's taking me, that takes me down, that hurts me, that frustrates me. When I'm mad, is my mistress, and that that's coke. But I'm willing to go as far as you want to, and willing to try as hard as I can, and that's a day-to-day -day struggle. I'll tell you a story from Las Vegas. We're doing a segment with Tappy, and a fan walks by, and during the commercial, he looks up and he says, "Hey, Johnny, you're a hero to me because you came from nothing and you made it." And Tapia looks down at him and says, I haven't made anything yet. I struggle every day. Every time I look at Johnny, every minute we spend, I constantly will catch myself memorizing lines on his face and, you know, the way he smiles, because I always think that's the last time I'm going to see him. I made it a habit being married to him not to think of tomorrow. You just don't. And Johnny will even tell you, never think of tomorrow because it may never come, and don't think about yesterday because it's gone. That's his favorite saying. You have to live in today, and that's what I've learned to do with him. I think my husband is overdosed. He disappeared on me on Thursday. He showed up just earlier this evening and was like really out of it. I got pulling on him, I got water on him, I tried everything. It was yet another overdose. 
police would find cocaine on Tapia when they answered his wife's call. And then, as he lay in a coma in the hospital once more, the episode turned tragic in an unexpected way. A day and a half after Tapia entered Presbyterian, the family got even more bad news. A car crash on Highway 550. Tapia's nephew and brother-in-law were killed. Family members tell us the two were headed to Albuquerque to see Johnny in the hospital. And everybody in the boxing world used to call them the married couple because they'd argue. And every video you see Johnny, you see my brother. That's Johnny's brother-in-law, Robert Gutierrez, who died in the crash on 550, celebrating a victory in the boxing ring back in 1997. That was my best friend. That was my partner. That was what we say in our language, my road dog. But I felt that I killed him because I was in the, I was in the coma. If I could take that all back, I would. I would. It gets sometimes it gets rough. I miss him. He is my partner. And like, I kind of messed it up because I fell in love with his sister. So <laughs> we would never fight. We'd argue, but we would never fight. And what will happen, he ended up marrying my niece. The cocaine police had located led to legal charges. It began an ordeal that would put Tapia in and out of prison for three and a half years. He was 43 years old when he was finally released. Today, Tapia is out of prison. He's still considered to be in community custody, but Tapia is allowed to fight at the OK Casino in Española, March 6th. And once again, he says he will try to stay on the right path. Well, why, why should our viewers or why should people at home listening to this believe you now? Well, they should. I mean, it's up to them. If they want to, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine, too. I'm OK. I got my wife and my kids back, and uh, they never left me. That's a good thing. The fighters are ready. Boxing fans are we ready. Tapia returned to the ring on March 6, 2010, the prime of his career long since gone. But the escape boxing could offer is still there. Then, a few months later, came a turn he never expected. Tapio was told since he was a small boy that his father was deceased, he learned otherwise when Jerry Padilla took a DNA test. Padilla and Tapio already knew one another, but Padilla started thinking he was Tapio's father after observing Tapio's mannerisms and comparing them to his children. Ah! <laughs> it's, it's touching. It's unreal. I mean, after 43 years, who'd ever think that I'd find my father then? My brothers. When we got the test, it was 99.97. So it was, you know, just, just a blessing. Jerry Padilla would be amongst the crowd of fans in attendance for Johnny Tapia's final fight on June 4th, 2011, at home in Albuquerque. Retirement meant more time for Teresa and their three sons. Hi, Mom. It's a happy Easter. It's a happy Easter, Mom. They had all become part of the story he defined himself by. Mi vida loca, my crazy life. It's my wife, Teresa. She also has one, too. Nikolai, I got Lorenzo, my boys. I got the Virgin Mary. And right here, I got the mom on this side, and then Teresa's on this side. They're all saints. They're all saints. You know, I got nothing, I got nothing but saints on my body. There was also a new role for Tapia to focus on after fighting, running his own gym and training kids whose backgrounds were all too familiar. It, she did it. Oh, Finally, for once in my life, I'm going to be a trainer, and I can yell at them like they yelled at me. If you feel that you want to train, you know, always welcome in my gym. It's Team Tapia. There he is. <laughs> my message to the kids to say, you know, all over the world, if you've never tried drugs, don't do it. First time's a mistake, second time's a habit. Please, don't do it. Number one for the most hip-hop and R&B, Kiss 97.3, DJ Lopez, welcoming 
With open arms and a big smile on my face, Team Tapia is in the KISS studios. Hey, you're not fighting, are you? No, I'm done. I retired. I just, it's in Josh Potters' hands right now. Josh, they, you're, they call you Pitbull. Pitbull, that's right, baby. How old are you? I'm 22. Damn, you're still a baby. All right, so still a pup. How, how, did it, pup. how did it all start for you to get in the ring with Team Tapia? Um, if I'm correct, I think he saw me fight at the Santa Ana yeah. in 2010. And, and from there, we kind of just started touching bases. And uh, he saw a lot of uh, potential, but also room for improvement. And so he took me under his wing. And we've been working at it ever since. And best choice I ever made. How many How many fights are on the card? Five. Five fights on Five the card. Fights on so the card. it's basically good. Take up your Saturday night then. You take up your, you're gonna watch some good fighters. You're gonna yeah. see your good matches. Uh, let them go see throw blows. Everybody's gonna bleed and everybody's gonna get it on. That's what we're doing on Kiss 97.3. <laughs> Shit, yeah, just give me a haircut. <laughs> 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 Alright, can you wrap up? <laughs> we don't care who sees. So what we do? Thank you, thank you.